and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer and uh, Dr. Greer, and I'm uh, very glad to be here on the World Fusion Network, which uh, hosts us every two weeks to bring you an update and information from uh, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and DisclosureProject.org. We are uh, going to be talking today uh, with Dr. Jan Bravo, who is a fellow emergency physician and also on the board of directors of CSETI and Disclosure Project, and we're going to be focusing on the case for universal peace, and uh, it's sort of an a uh, apropos topic for the season. We're in a season where we hope for peace on Earth, and now we're going to take you to a vision of peace that is not just on Earth, but is interplanetary and universal. And so that's really the focus of, of our conversation today, and of also uh, sort of the vision of uh, the path forward for the human race. As all of you know, one of the projects of uh, CSETI is to make open and peaceful contact with civilizations that are uh, intelligent species who have reached Earth or observing Earth, and to do so in the foundation of uh, universal awareness that uh, this is the really central uh, thesis of not only the protocols that we use for making contact, but the underlying uh, underpinning philosophical uh, perspective that all creatures in the universe, including humans, are awake and that a mind is a singularity, that the oneness of awareness and mind is a true experience and state that is the foundation for all the work that C-Study is doing and all the work that humanity has to engage in to become an interstellar civilization. So that's sort of a, a, an overview of what we'll be discussing. I'd like to I'll welcome Dr. Bravo to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to, to uh, ask you kind of what your perspective is on this subject, uh, Jan, from the point of view of having been out under the stars for dozens and dozens of weeks doing contact and, and uh, sort of what your experience of it is. Well, that's a good question. My experience, first of all, has been amazing. It's written up, uh, we've written, had many people write up the experiences, and there's much information on our website. But I will say today, um, it's an interesting um, exercise in uh, humanity, in relations, in not just humanity, but um getting to know other beings and other people and realizing not only is that possible, but it's happening. But part of it is that um, I've come to realize that we need to make an effort, and our effort needs to be with for the right reasons. Right. And when we do put out good intentions and really um, try to have relations, this is probably how, how relations should be, among countries and really among all peoples, with if if we put out the intention and really go with an open heart and really wanting uh, peaceful interaction, it happens and it happens every time. So that would be my first statement. It, it it's it's there and it's possible for all of us to do, and we've had a lot of experience with it. Right, right. And you know, some years ago, I wrote a paper that uh, uh, in in the first book that that I uh, wrote called uh, Extraterrestrial Contact, the Evidence and Implications. And, and in that, I talk about the evolutionary selection of non-hostility in interstellar civilizations. And really what I mean by that is that any civilization that can go from uh, a distant star system to our solar system has crossed way beyond the nuclear threshold or the atomic energy level of technology into uh, what we've discussed often on the show, the trans-dimensional uh, high voltage uh, scalar type of technology that allow for objects, which of course this is very apropos in the World Fusion Network, but it's very dated, is to where, where they literally dematerialize at one point in space and time and can reappear at another through um, resonant fields that are very, very high frequency, uh, high voltage systems, which means that a spacecraft and its occupants may be out in the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million years from here will literally drop out of linear space time in, uh, 
travel and traverse through other dimensions. But what this means, however, is that if they reach that level of development and have managed to survive what we're struggling with now, and that is having gone through the other uh, previous levels of technological exploration and scientific discovery, the sort of Einsteinian uh, E equals MC square uh, view of the, of the universe, uh, and therefore has have discovered the secrets of the atom, and therefore the potential for weapons of mass destruction, and they have not destroyed themselves yet, um, that this is very good news. In other words, uh, there's an implicit evolutionary selection because once you reach a certain level of technological capability, if there isn't a concomitant to development socially and spiritually, you're simply going to blow yourself up. And this is, this is, of course, what we've been facing with mutual assured destruction where uh, all of us or many of us grew up during the era of the Cold War when you had the Soviet Union and the United States with tens of thousands of thermonuclear weapons aimed at each other and a misunderstanding like the Cuban Missile Crisis could escalate to an event that would be an extinction level event for our civilization and our species. And uh, thank God that hasn't happened. Uh, but the, the point I'm making here is that if you have technologies that are 100 to 1,000 times more sophisticated and potentially, if weaponized, more destructive than a hydrogen bomb, and you haven't blown yourself and other planets up yet, this is a very good indicator that you've reached the point of evolution in your social and spiritual state where you can manage such technology and avoid the sort of uh, naked aggression and organized murder, which is what we call warfare, to survive to the next level. And I think this is a really important thing for people to think about because there's so much xenophobia out there about the extraterrestrial presence, you know, and, and the alleged alien agenda and on and on and on. And of course, just in the last couple of years, there's been something like 18 movies at some billion plus dollars in expense from Hollywood that have been portraying some sort of alien invasion scenario. And yet, when you think about it, it makes no sense at all. I mean, it, of course, it, it kind of fits with our own anthropocentric projection of the human condition onto these species. But in reality, if they have the capability to travel here and after, a priori, they have the technology to get here. And therefore, if they were hostile, it, there would be no shooting of lasers and uh, Star Wars looking things. It would be point set match over boom. Um, and I think that one of the problems is that we do tend to, uh, there's a wonderful Vedic saying that I'm sure everyone at the World Trade Network knows, and, and, and it's that the world is as you are, and that in reality, that how we view the extraterrestrial presence is usually a, a sort of a cosmic Rorschach test, a, a cosmic mirror that's held up and says much more about us and about these visitors who, from uh, everything we can analyze, are completely non-hostile, are socially and spiritually very developed, and that if they were, in fact, hostile, that long before they would have found our little corner of the universe, they probably would have blown themselves up, if not other planets along the way and themselves, because when you reach this point of technological capability, um, mutual assured destruction, it would be beyond that. It would, it would be uh, just a global mutually assured disintegration because the kinds of uh, energy systems that could be weaponized from the kinds of interstellar level of technology are, are so advanced that an entire planet could be uh, basically atomized and evolved if you were to weaponize that capability. And uh, given the fact that we've behaved, quite frankly, very bad as galactic neighbors in the last 50 years, targeting these extraterrestrial vehicles and on many occasions successfully hitting them with electronic weapons and downing them, which is what happened at Roswell, the fact that there hasn't been an, an aggressive knockback is enormous testimony to their degree of 
uh, almost Gandhi-like restraint and uh, spiritual and social evolution, as I understand it. Yes. Um, may I speak to a point? What you said is very important, and it, it reminded me that I think something is important to say at this point to some people who may be new to the uh, World Puja Network who might not have heard this message that we've said before. When we talk about interaction with other civilizations and, and peaceful interactions, a lot of people always say, well, I've never seen a spaceship. And that's what they expect. Well, it speaks to their level of development that they interact with us in many ways. Uh, right. Through consciousness-assisted technology about which you've spoken in the past, um, through sounds, through telepathic messages that people understand. Um, and, and these are all, it's really fascinating because these are all peaceful means, whereas if we just talked about the solid um, devices that people wish to see, there's a difficulty there. As he said, they can be shot down. But um, it speaks to the vast array of ways that they are working with us if we open and allow to it and, and that everyone can have contact. Yes, and, and, and also the, the lucid dream state. You know, in many cultures, such as the aboriginals of Australia and um, certainly the Cherokee, I'm, I'm part Cherokee Indian, there was a, a long tradition of lucid dream work and being awake within the dream and, and having experiences that were very real where you could experience things in real time but also see and experience the future. And this is the nature of consciousness, that it is omnipresent and infinite and not restricted to time or space. But because it's omnipresent, it allows you to awaken to any point in time and space, which also this salient fact is understood by these interstellar civilizations who, uh, by definition, have mastered in trans-dimensional or interdimensional uh, communication, thought, uh, and uh, travel at the point that it's very effortless for them to interface with us within the lucid dream state of the astral body uh, as easily as you and I can speak on these telephones that we're on. And that this is a, a level of understanding that is really important that throughout history, people have had these sort of experiences with, with civilizations and peoples from other worlds. And I think at one time, most of it was written off as either mythological, imaginary, or something from only the spirit world, when in reality, many of these experiences that are recounted by the Dagon tribe in, in Africa and, and throughout India and, and in the Vedas themselves talking about the Vimanas, many experiences, while there could have been a component where there was a materialized track or person there, could also happen in the state of consciousness, either during the lucid dream state or in the very deep meditative state where you're then freed from the limits of uh, space and time and you're in this expanded state of universal mind or cosmic mind and can begin to see, and it's been called remote viewing by pop culture uh, uh, recently, but it, it's really this ability of the seer and the individual to experience in consciousness the other realities and levels of uh, varying dimensions, including the thought world, the astral, the uh, pure consciousness state where you can appear and see remote places. And this is exactly how extraterrestrial civilizations are, are communicating, although they may have augmentation using very high-tech electronic devices that can interface with thought. Uh, nevertheless, they understand these trans-dimensional uh, aspects that all intelligent beings have. And the, the beauty of being a conscious being that's aware of awareness and capable of being aware of awareness is that we can be just become aware of just the pure state of mind. And that is ultimately, in, in, as I see it, the foundation of universal peace and of relations amongst peoples from other worlds is that there is this commonality that is transcendent. And that is the awake mind itself. And from that, that's the, that nexus of pure consciousness develops the capabilities to then understand that we have much more in common with these civilizations and these people than we can imagine. Uh, the ability to be awake, to think, to try.
travel in consciousness, to understand other dimensions, to have lucid dreaming capabilities, to um, see that the spark of pure consciousness is the singularity that is the same within all of us. So that then if they're, whether they're 18 inches high or 18 feet high or whether they're this color or that color or this thing or that thing, all that becomes sort of uh, ephemeral uh, and, and superficial and, and not essential. And the essential experience of consciousness then becomes the foundation for not only contact, but also for understanding what our relationship can be uh, with these other civilizations, even if they have very different IQs and very different emotional natures and very different cultures, which, of course, they will. I mean, look at the difference between, say, Japanese culture and Italians and or emotional tendencies or express the way people express themselves. And these are just amongst humans on Earth. There's such huge variety. Um, and never mind from person to person, even within a culture. So um, if you look at the whole cosmos, it's going to be an enormous diversity and variety. But the anchor in all this, the, the constant, as it were, the center of this vast sort of uh, uh, creation of, of uh, multiplicity and diversity is this centered place of pure consciousness, which brings us very back to the Vedic concept that all of this is that, that the, the state of that samadhi state, pure cosmic awareness of the silent meditative state of being, of pure essence of mind, this is really the foundation for uh, interplanetary relations and universal peace. And as we experience that, then we don't see these varying civilizations or peoples or forms or shapes as alien, which is why I try to avoid that word because it's basically a xenophobic word, but we see them more as us. That, you know, and, and the sort of the motto of, uh, of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence is uh, one universe, one people. And in reality, there is this essential oneness that, uh, transcends the multiplicity, and that's where we can be one people in the cosmos. So that concept, and the only concept is an experience of it together, out under the stars, sitting in a circle, even as ancient peoples did, is really what we're doing on these expeditions. And when, we, when the group reaches that level of coherence and deep oneness and meditative state, that's when these extraterrestrial civilizations appear. It, it's almost as if that's the cue that this is a group ready to make contact. And they're looking for that level of coherence and depth of awareness and oneness uh, before they do appear. Right. These are, actually, this reminds me, it, this is certainly possible for us to do on Earth, although we haven't quite achieved it yet, this level of peace even among our own tribes here on Earth, but we've seen um, hints of it, say, after geophysical calamities, and we know it's possible. And to imagine that on a cosmic level is amazing and astounding, but we do it all the time when we're out in the field. We do, and, and the, the big challenge is understanding that uh, humans and peoples, maybe from this planet and others, will always have differences, but it doesn't mean it has to go to the level of mass-organized murder, which is warfare. And I think that this is the big step we have not yet gotten under control. Unfortunately, humanity is at this stage where our science and technology, particularly the classified sciences we'll get to in a moment, have surpassed our social evolution and spiritual evolution. And that's when a, a, a civilization becomes very unstable and dangerous um, because we have we must be able to be ahead of our technology uh, in terms of our consciousness and in terms of our uh, level of social development so that these scientific breakthroughs are used for life supporting healing uh, beneficial and and the advancement of civilization rather than the destruction of civilization. And at this point, these big scientific breakthroughs, and most of the really important ones uh, since the 40s have all been classified, have only been retained and clawed back by the military.
military industrial complex and have been used for weapon systems and military purposes, which is why we're still burning oil and gas and coal instead of having free energy zero point type devices and anti gravity transportation and other types of devices. And that imbalance is causing society to get more and more off a path of, of evolution that is uh, advancing and positive. And this is this is one of the big challenges, if not the big challenge of our time, is for the people to understand this and to organize the good folks who understand the needs of this in the future and uh, say, well, look, we need to make a course correction and here's what it should look like. That these technologies are used only for peaceful purposes, that we collectively will ensure that, that we will uh, heal the earth and provide for her children and not weaponize these wondrous new sciences and technologies. And this is something we have to collectively come together and decide. It isn't going to happen through a Ouija board or uh, ETs landing on the White House lawn making it so. Not that the White House would have any say in this anyway. But frankly, because it, it's a classified project that are beyond the, the reach of the president. And I think that we, we as a, a people have to understand these issues and organize to, to make this a reality. Um, it is, in a sense, a true uh, evolution, revolution without, not, not a, and a bloodless one, I should say, but in thought and consciousness and ideas, uh, in order for us to go from the current state of the world to a state that is uh, advancing, peaceful, and where we're living in harmony with nature, but still in a very high-tech way. But to do that, these sciences and technologies have to be unveiled but unveiled in a way that we assure that they're used for peaceful purposes. And now, some people have said, well, doesn't that mean they should be kept secret? To which I say, absolutely not, because right now, you have the worst of both worlds. On the one hand, you have enormously powerful technologies that have been developed over the last 50 years that would liberate us from the death-defying, uh, horrific, damage we're doing to the environment due to oil and gas and coal and nuclear power and poisoning the world that we live in in that fashion. But it would also liberate the people of the world from the yoke of, of mind-numbing poverty where almost half the population of the planet of 7 billion people live in terrible poverty, which is a completely artificial reality that is the direct result of the macroeconomic energy-based system we have that requires uh, there to be the burning of expensive uh, oil and gas and coal or nuclear power in order for people to have basic electrification and refrigeration and transportation. This is something that simply cannot continue. Uh, and so the benefit of these sciences and technologies we have not seen yet, and yet the weaponization of them have been going apace for now 60 years with no checks and balances in place. And that means that these sort of breakthroughs in trans-dimensional sciences have been clawed back by this beast, this, this military-industrial complex, have been weaponized, have been trained on extraterrestrial vehicles. We have numerous witnesses that I've interviewed personally who have been part of those sort of operations. And unfortunately, this, this means that we have an aspect of our own species, humans, who have organized these technologies and applied them into weapon systems when they should never have been applied as weapon systems and should be uh, truly, those swords need to be made into plowshares, uh, where we would then benefit the earth and humanity. And this is a, an enormously pressing issue that you do not see people on Capitol Hill or in the White House or at the UN discussing. But I think people who understand that we're being visited by these civilizations and that they uh, that we have been doing the classified program studying it and that we do have these scientific breakthroughs and technologies, many of which are, are outlined at the Orion Project.org. You can see oh, many, many hundreds of pages of research papers there. But these sciences and technologies need to, to come out to benefit humanity, but that also we would have to vow as a people to um, de-weaponize them and to see that space is not weaponized uh, any further than it is now and that these 
technologies are used only for uh, life-supporting, peaceful means. We can do that if we come together as a people and vow to. Unfortunately, we live in a situation now where a very small percentage of the population has dominion over this subject in such a way that there are no checks and balances from uh, traditional government, and the people have been completely misled on the issue. And so I think this is something that is, is speaks to why disclosure is so important, and people can see what we're doing at disclosureproject.org for that, but also why we as a people need to come together and make contact with these civilizations uh, around the Close Encounter of the Fifth Time Initiative, the CE5 Initiative, which is described at CSETI.org. Um, the reason for that is because these civilizations are really waiting for humans to answer a call, and it's a cosmic call that's blown out. And it's, they're, they're calling for humans to understand mind, transdimensional sciences, and how thought and consciousness can interface with space and time and electronics, which is exactly how they communicate through vastness of space, the great distances of interstellar space. And, and that's what we're trying to share with people through uh, the training programs that we have so that more and more people, thousands of people, begin to do this, and that creates a morphogenic field, as Rupert Sheldrake speaks of, that shifts the direction of, of this whole uh, narrative away from conflict and alien invasion, you know, in 18 movies that portray that, to universal peace and open contact and enlightened contact. And this is really the essence of basically why I left medicine uh, full-time to do this. And, and I think that it's very important for people to understand that it's going to take that kind of uh, sweat equity by the people, that it isn't going to happen from Booz Allen Hamilton or Lockheed Martin or from the White House or the UN or Hillary Clinton. It's most likely going to come from us. And then as a secondary effect, when more and more open contact begins to happen and it's inevitable, then these sort of traditional leaders will have to get on board. So we have to lead this. And if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. That's that's absolutely right, and thank you for addressing that question. I have to say, um, I, very often I hear people say, well, these technologies uh, should not be out there, these new technologies to help everyone because they'll be weaponized, and you've just given a good explanation why people deserve these technologies and how they should be protected. Yes, and it's an act of great compassion for humanity and for our future and our children's children's children to take this action. And it's also an act of compassion to Gaia, the Earth, who is a conscious living being, who is, by the way, female. I had a very deep experience meeting Gaia once when I had, a, had an experience out in space. And, and she is really suffering under the foolishness of what her children are doing. And we have to have the compassion to lift that burden um, from her that we have placed upon the earth. And we can do it. The good news here is that we already have the scientific breakthroughs. We already have the knowledge. How do we bring it out? That's the question. And, and it, it's clear that it's going to take leadership from uh, people who are not part of uh, interest groups that want to keep a secret. I mean, it's just kind of, a, you know, should go without saying, but if you're feeding at the trough of the current macroeconomic energy system, which is also very much embedded into the political system, it's very hard for those people to take a leadership role. The other part of it is that when people do try to step out on these issues, they tend to have murder incorporated show up on their doorstep and threaten them. And this is why there's strength and, and, and uh, uh, safety in numbers and in unity. And the reason we've been able to do Disclosure Project and get as far as we have with contact at csetti.org and also the Orion Project is that we have, you know, many, many thousands of people working to do this and millions of people who follow uh, what we're attempting to do. What we have to do now is have everyone organize around uh, not only their teams, contact teams to make contact, but efforts to work together to bring out and disclose these sciences and technologies in a way that is safe uh, and a way that benefits the 
human human race, and it also benefits uh, the Earth, uh, and ultimately benefits interplanetary relations. In other words, meaning that they're used for peaceful energy generation and cleaning up the Earth and going into space peacefully as a united people. So this is a very big change from how we've been behaving, but it's time for that change. And as we hear on the eve of 2012, the famous 2012 day, we need to look at the big changes that are coming and take the power of that change and direct it and, and nurture it in, in this direction of universal peace and not slide into the old ways of an us versus them mentality. And one of the problems is that there is this tendency for humans, if someone is different from a different tribe or ethnicity uh, or what have you, race, religion, is to view it as otherness and therefore we should kill them or we should uh, fight with them. And this sort of uh, instinct, tribal instinct of division is something we have to transcend, but ultimately it, can, it won't be transcended as much on the level of the intellect as it will on the level of the heart and of the mind and the spirit, which is why the experience of the universality of mind is so important. It doesn't mean that there won't be differences and there won't be conflicts and disagreements, but it, doesn't, it means that we would be able to find ways of moving past them so that we don't go to the point of overt warfare and mass organized murder, which is what warfare is. I mean, uh, once a person asked me about, you know, why don't the ETs just come in here and clean up the mess and, uh, you know, land on the White House lawn? I go, look, you know, certainly they understand that civilizations such as ours have to learn these lessons uh, and that if we don't learn them through our own conscious evolution, it's not learned. It's imposed from outside and it's artificial. And so it's very important that the children of Earth take control of our destiny. There are civilizations out there ready to welcome us and to help us. But it isn't something that we're the primary movers because we're the children of Earth. And I think this is something most people don't look at. They get into sort of a cosmic codependency where these ET civilizations are either our enemies or our saviors. And in reality, we have to empower ourselves spiritually and culturally and socially and organizationally to make this transformation happen in conjunction with these civilizations, but not in a codependent way where we sort of think we're going to sit back and these civilizations are going to swoop in and fix all these problems for us. I, I seriously doubt that's how this is going to play out. So I think that, you know, that they're, they're very patient, obviously. I think the extraterrestrial civilizations, the contact we've had, the meetings we've had, the, the remote view experiences we've had, the specific species from various planets, there's a consistency in the message from them, and that is they're very much wanting to have this contact, but they very much want to see humans uh, correct these fundamental problems that have evolved over the last hundred years on Earth, which have moved us off our optimal evolutionary path. The optimal evolutionary path would have been a few decades of fossil fuels and about 100 years ago, the release of these advances in transdimensional electronics and some of the work that Tesla began to discover as well as Faraday and Maxwell that got swept away. And we would have created a civilization uh, that would have been peaceful and would have been abundant and provided for all the children of the earth so that we weren't in this zero-sum game of fighting over resources and fighting over land and territory. I, I, this is something that, that we have to do. And it, it, it's really very empowering to realize, however, that the sciences and knowledge are there, and also the science of consciousness has developed enough that we understand uh, how people working together from a deep level of awareness can make uh, what seem like miraculous things take place and that the conscious mind is omnipresent, and that as you experience that omnipresence and universality of mind, it's particularly with a group of people, there's a multiplier effect uh, that's exponential, not just arithmetic, um, yeah. that this empowers that direction of change. And this is what's so exciting about going out into the stars with a group of 
you know, 20 or 25 people in this state of cosmic awareness making contact and working on these issues together is that it does have that empowering effect. It's a very, it's prescient timing for this conversation because as we come on into 2012 and getting close to December 2012, it reminds me of Y2K in the year 2000 and people got so caught up in the fear and right. they bought into the fear of what would happen and we're still here moving along uh, 11 years later, almost 12 now, thinking about coming up to 2012, I know there are a lot of documentaries about the fear, and there's so much time spent on that that you have just said, you have just mentioned what we can actively do, applying ourselves. What is our choice to do? Stay in fear or move forward? Um, we have some great uh, trainings coming up this year, which I'm very excited about, and I think the contact's going to be amazing. And we're not going out there in fear. And I think that the more people who realize that there's choice in a lot of things that we do can really help put us over, you know, build up that morphogenic field and, and get humanity where we want to go. Yes, and, you know, the, 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 um, the attitude of the people who wish to make contact informs whether it occurs or not. It's interesting, some years ago uh, we had a, uh, a person who was who had tried to come to some of these events that we found later was really involved for ulterior purposes and was filled with all kinds of fear and, and other issues. And every time that person was around, the ET craft and beings would not be there. But if the person couldn't make it out that night or was had gone into you know a building or what have you. They would come in, and it was almost like clockwork. And this sounds almost unbelievable, but that there's, they absolutely know what the intention is because transdimensional sciences and technologies, I hate to say that they're reading everyone's mind, but they certainly know the intent of, of why someone would want to go out there. And if they have in their mind an operating paradigm of, oh, I'd like to get to know about this subject so I can become I later found out this person wanted to become the next Rockefeller of energy and learn what the sciences and technologies were so he could become a trillionaire. And uh, <laughs> this came out after the fact, but the point I'm making is that with these extraterrestrial the spacecraft and people would not appear when this person was around, which was really kind of bizarre until later we learned what the real agenda was that was operating in this man's heart and mind. And this sounds really magical to folks, but it isn't if you understand transdimensional technologies and sciences, and, and that these civilizations really are not wanting to interact with people for that purpose. They're really wanting to interact with humans for the purpose of developing a relationship and uh, peaceful communication and contact. They know that we already have many scientists who understand these sort of energy systems, but we, the people, haven't organized a means to bring them out yet. And so it's not like the ETs are going to land and hand us a device and say, here, let's manufacture this through General Electric. Well, General Electric actually has had these sort of technologies that they put on a black shelf, as have many other corporations, such as Lockheed Martin and other big industrial behemoths. So the question is, we, as humans, have access within our minds all the levels of science and technology that any other civilization would have. They have to be developed in a sequential way so that we can apply them. But the big leap forward hasn't happened yet in terms of applying these non-local sciences and technologies that pull energy out of the fabric of space-time and that are transdimensional sciences and technologies because there are so many vested interests that have squashed it over the years, and, and the squashing of it is something that has been very well thought through and is it, ongoing, as, 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 as certainly Dr. Bravo, you and I have experienced and, uh, with the Orion Project, but it doesn't mean that it, it can't happen. It just means that we have to do more as a people to organize around that. We have to do more to make open contact, and one of the things that we have now, you know, those of you with iPhones and iPads, we have a um, resetting contact app 
that you can download, and it has all the meditation techniques on it, the tones that we project out into space for contact. It actually enables the iPhone to become a magnetometer that picks up when uh, trans-dimensional craft are around that may not be visible with the naked eye, but will begin to shift the magnetic field around you. Um, all these sort of things are in this app. It's an amazing app. I've been at, um, Todd Goldenbaum developed it for us. And that's available to people. And, and the whole training uh, program is available at disclosureproject.org. Um, and uh, that is in addition, of course, to people who, if they have the time, can come out with us for a week out under the stars. We're going to be going for a week on uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, in uh, Florida. Uh, in April, and so people who have the time and can come with us for a whole week are invited to join us. Last year when we were there, we had the most extraordinary contact that took place right on this beautiful state beach that we had um, exclusive use of for the week, and uh, there was literally three and a half hours of trans-dimensional energy fields and craft appearing and disappearing right on the beach and over the mangroves by the beach and was filmed and witnessed by people for three and a half hours. So we're very excited to go back there in April. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have uh, a, a sort of an acceleration of what happened this past year, and I think we will. Yes, that was that was an excellent time. Uh, a lot of the footage, because there's so much, and, and the person who processes it has to go frame by frame but we do have i just found out actually yesterday that more has he's found more so oh when goodness. we can when we can put this up we will but we yeah. do have yeah. and we need to we need to process it but it's very exciting and we're as soon as we can put it on the CSETI website uh uh we will so yes and uh, we have a volunteers come forward to help us do some of this on youtube unfortunately i'm not the person to do all that internet and tech stuff and everyone we're dealing with are volunteers and have their day jobs and lives so but at any rate we're going to try to get these things out as soon as we can and uh, one of the things that, that people can also do is that they can form their own local contact team and then be part of a global contact initiative that uh, Costa, who's been on the show with me a couple of times, is, is helping coordinate. We're on a given night, in, in, in a certain weekend night, uh, uh, in a given month, uh, teams from all over the world, hundreds of people will go out at the same evening, and that creates this shift in consciousness that potentiates contact, and people have been having extraordinary contact experiences, not only with materialized craft and beings, but also transdimensional electronic tones, uh, telepathic contact, amazing experiences. And uh, so that's something that people can also be part of. And information on that is at csepi.org as well. So, yes. I will say that uh, many of these people, and uh, especially a lot of people, even though people come from all over the world to the trainings, so many of these people, I just want to emphasize, have never been to a training. They've just gotten yes. information from the website. It is there. You know, and many people, you know, of course, I mean, if anyone who looks into this subject, you know, is sort of turned off immediately by all the negativity uh, on it, you know, everything from abductions to cattle mutilations to this thing to alien invasion and blah, blah. And, you know, basically, many times that, you know, of course, and I've been challenged to more than once with people saying, well, what if there are some, one or two of these civilizations out of hundreds that are out there? that are hostile, and I point out, first of all, there's not a scintilla of evidence that that's the case, but let's, let's play devil's advocate and say there is. What would be the response? Nuclear weapons, putting weapons in space, taking these advanced trans-dimensional electronic weapons and going to interplanetary war? This would be worse than mutual assured destruction. So the, the path of safety and wisdom is still to do what we're doing with the CE5 initiative, the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, which is when humans initiate the contact from a higher level of consciousness to make peaceful contact. So we call this whole training program ambassadors to the universe, not ambassadors to the ETs that look like they came from Norway. So I, I think that it's 
really important to understand that we have to transcend the sort of latent racism and xenophobia that permeates the UFO subculture and understand that even if it were true, and I'm not at all saying it is, but even if it were true that there is a civilization out there, wouldn't be the wise path be exactly what we're doing? It wouldn't be going out there in armed conflict because if we couldn't survive mutual share of destruction with the Soviet Union, we certainly couldn't survive an exchange between one planet and another using weapons that are a hundred or a thousand times more destructive than a thermonuclear weapon. This is ridiculous. So no matter what your view on that would be, the path of wisdom and of safety and of the future is peace. The only possible future for the human race here on this planet, given the technologies we have today, and out in space is peace. And we have to find a way to make that real. Because it's no longer adequate to have world peace. We have to have universal peace, interplanetary peace. And that's the big challenge of the next, well, certainly of the rest of our lifetimes, and perhaps for several hundred years. But that is the big challenge that, that uh, lies ahead of us. And it sounds very futuristic to be thinking and talking about universal and interplanetary peace and relations when we're still fighting and squabbling on this planet. But in reality, it is that we have to be able to walk and chew gum. We're going to have to be able to take care of all these issues in a fairly short time frame. And the reason for it is that technologies are going to continue to develop. And we're going to have to, as a people, consciously, socially, spiritually, be up to the task of our level of development scientifically. And that would require an interplanetary uh, peace and interplanetary relations. And this is why the CE5 initiative and the consciousness behind it and the ethic behind it is so key. And this is why when we go out into the stars, we're not there trying to make contact with this ET group, but not that one, or this one, and then not that one. There's none of that going on, because that is a very, uh, that's exactly the kind of divisive mindset that gets us into these conflicts. And, you know, you look at the last 100 years of the human race. We were dropping atomic bombs on Japan. Now they're some of our closest allies. We went to complete all-out war with Germany, and now they're our closest allies in Europe. We, you know, so this sort of vacillating and, and going through these periods of upheavals using war as the solution is simply a paradigm that has to be put permanently to rest and put another foundation in there that creates a permanent, long-lasting, universal peace. That's the future that we must manifest together. That's that's a great vision, and it's it's already sh- it already should have happened. I don't see it as really futuristic at all. It should have been here before, but uh, we can help bring it about. Yes, and of course, I view it as something where many times people say, "Well, gosh, isn't that very idealistic and futuristic?" I said, "No, it's very yeah. practical." And it's actually we're about 50 to 100 years late. So there's nothing futuristic about it. It's only futuristic if you haven't been informed of of the facts of the last 100 years. And I often refer to this as the missing century. If I had time, I would write a book called The Missing Century that would talk about the last 100 years of uh, events and uh, technologies and uh, all kinds of information that have just been shoved into a black box and kept secret. And it really does constitute a missing century in human development. Um, I know many people feel very, you know, sort of puffed up that we have cell phones and smartphones and the Internet. But those telecommunications systems are still running on a coal-fired power grid uh, and uh, or even in some cases worse, you look what happened in Japan, a, a nuclear-powered grid, which is basically getting uh, a steam engine from heat by splitting an atom. That's all a nuclear power plant is. It's basically a fancy steam turbine like we used to have in the 1800s. Um, but you're, you're getting the heat for the steam from uh, uh, splitting the atom instead of uh, burning coal or oil or something or hydrothermal. So I think that what people have to understand is that these changes are within our ability to make because the sciences and technologies are expanded. They're not, they're, they may be hidden and they may be suppressed, but they're there. 
and the knowledge is there. I, you know, I always say to people, I'm sure at least 99% of the human race are in favor of living together peacefully, working together peacefully, and going into space peacefully. There are very few people who are addicted to this paradigm of endless war, but somehow they have so much money and power and influence that they're, they're you know, uh, this is the other part of the 99%. 99% of that, if you took up 7 billion people, I seriously doubt <laughs> out of the 7 billion people, the 1% of that would be 70 million. I doubt there are 70 million people really that devoted to uh, global or interplanetary war. And so more than 99% of the human race would embrace this vision. And so we have to articulate it, share it, and organize around it to the best that we can because that's the really the only viable future. We really only have one option. It's either annihilation or peace. And so when we go out under the stars, we are specifically not picking and choosing amongst ET races or species. We're specifically saying we are humans who are in this state of universal mind. We see with the eye of oneness and that we are all one with these other civilizations at this deep level of transcendent pure consciousness. And we also acknowledge that we have more in common than would be different because of this essential oneness of sentient self-awareness, of being able to be aware of this greater self, of the higher self, of this conscious universal mind. And that is the foundation for making contact, and that is with all of them. And then Approaching it that way, it transcends all the mythologies and conflicts and what have you. And if we have to do that with each other as well, whether someone is of another race or if someone's gay or straight or if someone is uh, a different gender or someone's a different uh, ethnicity or what have you, that basically we need to see the light of awareness and spirit within that person and see, well, we have a lot more common with that than we do whatever cultural differences there would be. This is a true spiritual challenge. And I, I, I've always said that the, the root of our problem on this planet is spiritual, and therefore the solution will be spiritual. Yeah, that makes sense. Well said. So, well, I um, do want people to uh, feel free to, to uh, join us at this event that we're having in uh, Marco Island, Florida, that will be in uh, April. The information and dates uh, for that are at CSETI, CSETI.org. And um, we're going to also uh, then this summer be out in Milwaukee for Colorado for a week, and, and then we will be uh, at Mount Shasta, uh, California. Uh, in August, and uh, so we have a number of events planned throughout the year, uh, and then uh, we'll be in the desert southwest uh, later in, in November of 2012. So we have a number of, of upcoming events that are posted um, up on our website, so if you'd like to join us, uh, we'd like to extend a heartfelt invitation to all of you who, who appreciate the importance of universal mind and uh, one of the things we do at these, and, and I've taken to doing this um, pretty much every night, is I do a puja um, that brings in the power of universal mind and a remembrance of the teachings of the great masters that are universal in their perspective. And we uh, love doing this in our circle when we can, if it's not windy or bad weather. Uh, out in the stars are right at sunset together, and it's just a wonderful way of starting our contact uh, event for the evening is to do a puja. So those, I mean, I normally don't talk that much about that, because, but it's the World Puja Network. Of course, everyone on the World Puja Network understands um, the tradition of, of the puja and also of, of universal consciousness and the science of consciousness. So that is the foundation of what we're doing, and uh, we hope that the, some of you who are listening will join us at these exciting events out under the stars. Uh, yeah, and again, if you have some wonderful event happen or something you wish to communicate with us, please let us know. We'd love to hear about your experiences as well. Oh, yes, very much. So recently we had a, a, a young man who's in college who learned the, I don't know if it was from the iPhone app or, or from the training kit program that we have, but he had not been on one of these trainings. That were, I've, I've never met this gentleman, but he had this experience where 
he practiced it and he was going to bed doing the meditation protocols and suddenly an extraterrestrial face and being appeared in front of him. And then he just fell asleep. And the next day he was driving out to the mountains to go camping with his uh, girlfriend. And it was in daytime. He was hidden up in the mountains in this beautiful spacecraft completely materialized and went along beside the car for a distance. And he actually sent us drawings, some very good drawings of it. Um, and he couldn't believe, he initially thought all this couldn't be true and that it was just crazy. And he did it. And now he's saying, oh, my God, this is actually how contact is made. So, and, you know, I, I tell people, that, you know, you don't have to be, you know, Sai Baba or Gurudev or Maharishi or Yogananda to do this. Every human being that's conscious and awake can become aware of that mind. And we give the meditation techniques and teach people to do the contact using thought with these ET civilizations. And if it's done with a pure heart and an open mind, people are astonished, really, at how easy it is and also that these ET civilizations are eagerly waiting for us to answer the cosmic call that has been put out. They're waiting for humanity to do exactly what we're doing. Right, right. So let's answer that call. And when we come together in oneness to do that, that becomes a force for universal peace. So on that note, we will wish all of you happy holidays and a wonderful solstice and and also uh, a great new year. And uh, we hope to see many of you in 2012. So God bless you and keep looking up. Thank you, Jan. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.